Hi, today we are going to be taking a look at the work in chapter 5. We are going to be taking a look at our enzymes. Okay, so we start off by biological catalysts because that is what enzymes are. Now, what is a catalyst? A catalyst is a substance that increases the rate of a reaction but it does not become changed by the reaction. Um, it stays exactly the same. There's no um, change, it does not get used up after the reaction. It is exactly the same and it can carry on and do the exact same reaction over and over and over again. So enzymes are proteins that act as biological catalysts. Now you might think what is a biological catalyst? Now biological simply means that it's inside of living organisms like our cells. It's a protein inside a living organism that speeds up the rate of a reaction. For example, we've got amylase which breaks down starch to maltose. We've got protease which breaks down proteins to smaller subunits which are amino acids. We've got catalase which breaks down hydrogen peroxide to water and oxygen. Now, not all enzymes break down molecules into smaller units. Starch phosphorylase um, actually takes glucose molecules and it builds these glucose molecules together um, to form starch. So it's taking smaller molecules to make a bigger molecule, uh, but the reverse can also happen. Like some enzymes take small molecules, build them up to a bigger molecule, and other enzymes take big molecules and split them into two or three or however many pieces, um, but they break them down. Now when it comes to naming, a lot of enzymes are named after the reactions that they catalyze. For example, carbohydrates, they break down carbohydrates. Proteases break down prote proteins and lipases break down lipids. And so it's pretty easy to kind of guess almost because the names are so similar to each other. However, some enzymes have more specific names and that is because they've got a more specific function. For example, amylase which breaks down starch to maltose but then we've also got maltase which breaks down maltase and we've got sucrase which breaks down sucrose so though those it's easy to sometimes get the name however not all the names sound similar for example amylase which breaks down starch they don't sound similar so you have to remember those okay but how does an enzyme actually work well, there's this model called the lock and key um, model and it's how it works is the enzyme basically functions, think of it as the lock and think of the substrate which is the molecule that binds to the enzyme as the key. So the lock is specific, locks are specific for certain keys. So for example, if we've got an enzyme here that has this shape and we've got a substrate with a complementary shape um, it actually binds to the it can bind to the enzyme and this is important because all molecules have different shapes so if we've got a different shape molecule it won't be able to bind to this enzyme uh, and the enzyme can't uh, process uh, the substrate um, and this area where the um, substrate binds to the enzyme is actually called the active site all right so this is our lock and key mechanism and as you can see here we've got our enzyme uh, this is the enzyme's active site and here we have two substrate molecules about to bind to those active sites so once the enzyme and uh, substrates have bound it becomes known as the enzyme substrate complex and what happens here is that the enzyme links these two molecules it joins these two molecules together to form a different molecule to form a product and this is how an enzyme can change a substrate um, and change it into a different molecule so section 5.2 states that enzymes have properties there's six properties so let's quickly run through them all enzymes are proteins all enzymes have an optimal temperature they also have an optimal pH level at which they function all enzymes are also denatured by high temperatures. All enzymes are catalysts and all enzymes are specific. Remember the lock and key uh, model that we just discussed? An enzyme is specific to a certain substrate 
it can't uh, process any substrate. So different substrates will bind to different enzymes. So one of the properties is that enzymes are denatured by high temperatures. Now denatured simply means that it's destroyed. High temperatures will destroy enzymes and they basically can't function anymore and metabolic uh, reactions will stop. Now it's important to note that most enzymes um, function optimally at a higher uh, temperature and this is because collisions are more frequent between the enzymes and the substrate. Remember in solids the molecules are moving slow and in liquids the molecules move a bit faster but in gases there's high energy and those molecules are just like they're just going and collisions are um, more frequent and they're also um, more energetic and that is why enzymes function optimally at high temperatures because the substrate and the enzymes are connecting with each other more frequently. Now when we go above a certain temperature, the enzyme active site becomes destroyed and it can't bind to any substrate at all. So it's basically, it's denatured, it's broken, it's destroyed. <laughs> the temperatures at which uh, enzymes denature vary. Enzymes in the human body usually denature around 40 degrees Celsius and that is because the human body is about 37 degrees Celsius and that is actually the optimal temperature at which enzymes in the human body function. So it functions at an optimal temperature but if you go higher than that optimal temperature at a certain point um, you'll reach a temperature that is so high that the enzyme will become denatured. As I said enzymes function at uh, different optimal temperatures. For example, enzymes in our digestive systems function optimally around 37. The enzymes in plants are much lower. They function at 28 to 30 degrees Celsius and then enzymes, some enzymes can actually function in really hot conditions and like up to 75 degrees Celsius, for example, in hot springs. Now, the other one of the other properties that I quickly want to discuss is the property that enzymes also function optimally at certain pH levels. Now the pH scale ranges from 0 to 14, 0 being very acidic and 14 being very basic. Um, and a lot of enzymes function optimally at a neutral sort of pH which is um, exactly 7. Um, as many enzymes are, will actually become denatured at very acidic or very alkaline conditions. But it's important to note that not all enzymes will become denatured at these extremes. Some enzymes, like enzymes in our uh, stomach, actually function optimal at around pH 2, which is really acidic. So just keep in mind that not all enzymes have an, uh, the same optimal pH. They vary extremely. Phew, it's hot in here. Let's take a quick break before we look at past papers. Let's take a look at some past paper problems. All right, question 11 asks, says the diagram shows a lock and key model of enzyme action. So let's quickly identify our substrate. That would be our substrate. Um, this would be our enzyme. This would be our enzyme substrate complex. This would be our enzyme that remains unchanged and these would be our products. Um, so the question asks us which is the enzyme and which is the substrate. Well we know that's the enzyme, so 3 is the enzyme, 1 is the substrate. So now all we do is we go look for our options and, and that would be C. Um, 1 is our substrate and 3 is our enzyme. Alright, let's take a look uh, here at question 12. The table shows the temperature and pH at which, different, which 4 different enzymes are most active. Now the question asks us which enzyme is a protease from the stomach. Now if you remember, enzymes that work in our stomach actually function optimal at a very acidic pH. Enzymes in our uh, stomach actually function optimal at around pH 2. They function around a pH of 2 and this will be our, our answer. Let's take a look here at question 8. The graph shows that how the activity of an enzyme varies with temperature. There's our rate of enzyme activity, our temperature is plotted here on the x-axis. The question asks us, uh, what is the best or optimum temperature for this enzyme and at what temperature is the enzyme not working? 
So we basically have to identify the where the peak is here because that's the rate. So we're looking for the optimum temperature which means the highest rate of activity of an enzyme. Now it's very easy to make a, uh, this might seem like a very easy straightforward question and it is but it's easy to make mistakes here because it could easily be, you could be like yeah that's around uh, 40 it looks right but that's actually not correct. What you need to do here is you actually need to take a ruler and put it on the peak and see where it lands on our x axis and here we can see it's actually not 40 it's actually more like around 50 so that would be our best our optimum temperature so we've got two options here um, c and d now but we need to also to identify at what point is the enzyme not working so at what point is our y axis at zero so it doesn't start at zero but here we can see at temperature 60 degrees celsius that's where the enzyme has become denatured and it's not functioning at all. So our answer here would be D. Wait. Answer would be D. <laughs> all right, let's take a look at a bit of a longer question. Pectinase is an enzyme used in the production of fruit juice. Describe in detail how enzymes function using pectinase as an example. So. Describe how enzymes function. So I want you to go and make notes. You need to make notes for six marks on the function of enzymes. Section B of this question tells us an experiment to test the effect of the size of apple pieces on the activity of pectinase was performed by a group of students. Some of the apparatus is, sh is shown in figure 2.1. So this is the apparatus. The question asks us to describe how the student should use the measuring cylinder to obtain accurate measurements of volume. Now to accurately measure our volume, you need to take the reading at eye level parallel to our water. Um, so you would need to take the reading at the same level as the water. You can't take the reading from above or uh, below because that would result in a parallax error. And the second uh, mark would be for you need to take the reading at the bottom of the meniscus. If you don't know what meniscus is, I need you to go uh, read up on water meniscus. Section C asks or tells us the students added 15 centimeters cubed of pectinase solution to pieces of apple in a beaker. They then poured the mixture into the funnel. They found that it took 10 minutes to collect 19 cubed centimeters of juice. Now the question asks us to calculate the rate of enzyme reaction. So the reaction is measured in centimeters cubed per minute. So we know we need to take our centimeters cubed, divide it by our 10 minutes, and that should give you an answer of 1.9, which you can round up to two. Section C2 says the students performed four experiments using different ways to prepare the apples. The same total mass and type of apple was used each time. So in experiment A, they used 0.5 cube centimeters of apples, B, they used 1.0, and in C, they used whole peeled small apples, and in D, they used the whole unpeeled small apples. So the question asks us to predict and explain which experiments A, B, C, or D would result in the fastest rate of reaction. So, our fossils, our rate of reaction would be determined by the surface area exposed to the enzyme because the enzyme is what's going to catalyze this reaction. Now the smaller um, uh, uh, the pieces are, the greater surface area would be exposed to the um, enzyme. So our smallest pieces would be A, which is 0.3 centimeters. So that would result in the fastest rate of reaction. Now the slowest rate of our reaction, just for inches sake, would be our, I would say, would be our whole peeled small apples because they, first of all, it's whole apples. But why I chose peeled instead of unpeeled is that the peel would actually protect the apple. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed today's lesson. Study hard and go and get those good marks.